On today's show, it is that time of year, our first installment of the Player Capsule Series with my friend Glenn Willis of ATL and 29, and it's coming to you right now. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1704 of the Lockdown Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you here in late April. And today's podcast is brought to you by the folks at Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on the classic Monopoly game. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go right now for free on the App Store or Google Play. Also want to encourage you at the top of the podcast to make us your first listen each and every day. Please check us out and subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast. That includes Spotify, that includes Apple Podcasts, that includes YouTube, and again, anywhere you might find your podcasts. Today is actually going to be part one of two with my friend Glenn Willis of ATL and 29. Glenn is a regular on this podcast, and also he will join me for the second straight year, maybe third straight year. I'm not, when, I'm not entirely sure, actually, but he's been here quite a, quite a while and quite often in the offseason in recent years because he has graciously agreed to join me for the Player Capsule Series. So basically, we'll get into more of it, but it's going to be touching on all the guys on the Hawks roster individually and to varying degrees of depth, depending on uh, who we're talking about. On that particular day, but today is sort of the part one of all that. We'll sort of dig into what this is actually trying to accomplish on the series, as well as a couple of different players, Trent Forrest, Bruno Fernando, also Wes Matthews. We'll get into all those guys on this two-part episode. So again, two parts. This is part one right now, and here we go, myself and Glenn. I am joined once again by my friend Glenn Willis of ATL 29, veteran of this podcast. Glenn, how are you here in late April? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. It's, it's funny, one of the, uh, I guess, benefits of the Hawks not being in the playoffs as I'm taking in more of the actual playoffs. You know, normally people like you and me are rewatching, you know, breaking down some film, preparing for your podcast, you know, and it's just, uh, it, not, not that this is the route I know Hawks fans wanted them to go down. Uh, well, I mean, some did, some wanted them to, you know, optimize their traffic for this. At year. the end. But, yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, <laughs> but, it, but it's, it's, I do feel like I'm consuming more, you know, of the other playoff, um, games at a deeper level now, and, and that's been a nice kind of change of pace. Definitely, I would say that's uh, that's definitely the case, and uh, it is interesting. It hasn't been the most competitive playoffs, uh, at least in terms of like series games and stuff like that. Um, it has been interesting. Like people have been making notes. I saw as we're recording this, we're recording this on Saturday night, but you made some notes about like what you've observed from the playoffs so far, broadly speaking. And there's been a lot of talk about team building. That's what happens this time of year, especially when it's a team like the Hawks that are out of it. It's like, all right, what do we need in the future? Everyone wants to immediately go to that. And I understand I'm the same way in some respects, but um, we don't have to go super long on this, but like anything sticking out to you right now, as far as like what informs the Hawks, because it feels like everyone just wants to trade everybody as always. Glenn. That's, I know, that's your favorite thing always. Yeah. I mean, I, so I understand the instinct to want to see the roster change because the roster needs to change. It needs to, my word is to iterate it forward into something better fitting for what Quinn wants to do, just all that sort of stuff. But I, I think, you know, and, and I put this out in a short thread was continuity is undervalued. You look at like what Oklahoma city has been building this up for what, like five or six years. Uh, right after I tweeted that, I saw Ramona Shelburne's article on the Nuggets and how they've been team building for years. And th there is an aspect of kind of building up to this. And you can see in Phoenix and, and the LA Clippers how it's kind of dropping, you know, players onto a roster and rolling the ball out is is not a, is not enough. I, mean, I know people are like, well, well, the Heat, you know, well, I mean, LeBron was in his early prime when he made that move, right? And Bosch yeah. was early mid prime and, and Wade was, you know, pretty young. And stuff. So there's a lot, to, a lot of, a lot of ways to go about this. But continuity matters. I've talked about the fact that the Hawks have had not good organizational continuity, coaching changes, you now a front office change recently, and kind of just different directions that they're going. It feels like every 18 months there's a bit of a reset there. But you can see in this playoff uh, run right now, even though we're you know what, a little halfway through the first round, depending upon how long these series go. Yeah. Um, just that teams of continuity and teams that are just kind of keep building up and building up and building up are the ones that are doing better at this, at this point in time. And, and it's funny because, you know, when you and I are getting ready, I was mentioning like Denver is such a great case study um, because, you know, just one example is, you know, think back to whatever number of years ago, five, whatever it was, 
Uh, and at that point in time, Gary Harris was viewed as like, like just absolutely has to be in the organization. I loved him, right? And great values guy, great teammate, great leader. But the organization did not let their affinity for him and their appreciation for him and their value for him be an obstacle to making the move that they needed to make to kind of get to the next level. And that is, I think, something that's informative, not just for the Hawks, but all organizations are trying to build up is you sometimes I think have to fight this battle between, yeah, but I feel this way about this player. I appreciate this player. He's, he's given us so much and we want to be loyal, but there's also this other type of player out there that is really going to help us move the needle where we need to move the needle. And I think that's, that's instructive for, I think many organizations who are trying to, to build up. Yeah. Making those hard decisions. And it is really interesting when you look at the, the continuity part, because I, I joke about that a little bit, but it's something that um, not everybody thinks about. It's, it's kind of like, and I'm not, this is not even pejorative towards anybody. It's just like, there's a lot of like, here's the depth chart. Like how can it look the best? You know, like what, what splashy trade can we make? And um, you know, it's not always the case, but if you were someone, I, I know how you think about team building. Um, it's been a kind of an early win for you in these playoffs because the teams that kind of went star hunting and like did the big splashy things have, have not done well. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, again, Phoenix did not exactly do my favorite team building job. I did not like what the, what the Suns were doing. The Bradley Bill trade was weird, all those things, but like the teams that have pushed their chips in for these, you know, the Clippers, same kind of thing. They've had some, obviously had some injury issues. It's never a perfect scenario, but um, the continuity teams, the teams that have built with, yeah, they have to, I can already hear people saying this now. Yes. Denver has Jokic. Obviously, it's easier to build when you have the best player in the world. It's nice. But their continuity is incredible. Those guys fit perfectly together. They are talented. But, and yeah, you know, the Hawks have different challenges, but um, there's debates going on. We will not do that today about, like, what you want to do in the backcourt and all those things. And um, I feel like we're doing this now. In particular, I asked that question because you and I are – hope, and I appreciate you doing this with me again – going to talk about all the, all the players on the roster and inevitably get into some team-building questions along the way, purposely or not purposely about what the Hawks might do, what the players might do. And uh, this kind of weaves throughout. So if you're a new listener, I'll just say this, like some of these player capsules might be long. Some of them might be not so long. Um, today, we're going to do some ones that are a little bit shorter because they're the, kind of the end of the roster guys, a couple of free agents. They're worth talking about, but not going to be uh, as long on Trent Forrest as we would do on DeJounte Murray. You know what I mean? That's just kind of, that's the reality of the situation. It's not quite as impactful. All respect to Trent. But we kind of give, the whole picture at least aim to obviously you can't talk about every single thing although you might you and i might try glenn we you and i have a tendency <laughs> to get pretty long on these but uh it's kind of a balance of what they did this year what they might project to do in the future stuff they work on like I, I used to call them player reviews and last year we changed to capsules because inevitably it's going to be a little bit of looking ahead like you're, you're going to kind of project forward talk about what a guy is and look back so I don't know if that's a perfect synopsis of what, what this is going to be, but we've done this a couple years in a row now. Again, I very much appreciate you doing it with me. And it's a really uh, – people love, people love it. I was getting questions uh, as soon as the season was over, like when are the player caps are starting? I was like, I got to ask Glenn if he wants to do this again. I can't cool. assume. He's, he's Glenn's a busy yeah. man, but I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a, uh, one of the more fun kind of uh, 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 frameworks to kind of look back at the season and look ahead. And I I, I, I enjoy it a lot. Uh, I think – I think this roster, even with the undesirable outcome from a fan's perspective and organization perspective, there's a lot of decision points. And so I think I, I do think kind of looking player by player right now is as interesting as it gets, even though the Hawks season, broadly speaking, maybe seems less interesting than, than <laughs> other recent seasons. Today's show is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that might push things a little bit further when you're behind the wheel? Do you ever think about what the adventure might be waiting for you around the next corner when you're driving? Our friends at Nissan have a lot of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to that next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for both city drives and great escapes alike. As a classic, a classic exclusive Google built in, that's your updating assistant for call on for everything that you actually need for your vehicle. You don't have to connect your phone anymore because Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen. It was in the system with the Nissan Rogue and the 2024 Rogue. It's perfect for like Nissan's crossover for your next big adventure. They also have an incredible lineup beyond the Rogue that includes the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder, which has seating for eight people, as well as expensive cargo capacity, along with the advanced available 404 capability that you're looking for, as more than 280 horsepower, 6,000 pounds of towing, and when 
and that adventure calls you, the Pathfinder is going to be there to answer that call for you. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. One more time, the place to go is NissanUSA.com. Today's show is brought to you by Monopoly Go. And I've been told before that I'm actually pretty competitive. I definitely admit that that's the case in some respects. I think we all have that competitive side on some level. My competitive side loves Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's been downloaded over 100 million times at this point in time. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you actually can play on not just one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards, crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. And the best part, honestly, is be able to mess with your friends at the same time. You can charge rent on your iconic properties, just like in the classic Monopoly game, or you can now rob their vaults of riches for yourself. And the leaderboard show who the biggest Monopoly tycoon happens to be. It's not just competitive stuff that actually loves this game as well. You can also team up with your friends or people all, all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game right now. I definitely recommend that and join your friends by downloading Monopoly Go right now. You can do it also for free at the App Store or Google Play Store. The place to go, again, is the App Store or Google Play Store. Monopoly Go is the place is to, is the thing to download. And one more time, download Monopoly Go today. So obviously, it was not the ending anybody wanted. And I've done a little bit of table setting in previous episodes. I did most recently uh, kind of like the eight broad storylines of the offseason. Even acknowledging on that show, like that doesn't cover everything, but just kind of going a little bit bigger, um, talking about like exit interviews. I know you guys did on ATL 29 as well. It's been a busy time, even though it's not a busy time. But I, I say all that to say, let's dive into some players, and I'm sure we'll have a detour along the way. I, I do want to start with, and this is not in, I'll just say it's like, we're not going to do this in, in any particular order, but it is kind of strategic in some respects. Last year, you and I infamously waited to do the Troy Young player capsule until like August. I feel like we did it in August because it was <laughs> like, like it. we just kept pushing it back and back because I was like, guys, he's not getting traded. We can just wait forever on this till we actually need to do it. We, we finally did it this year. I got to be honest with you, Glenn. I think we might do Jalen last because Jalen's the guy I feel most confident being on the team <laughs> next year. I think he's a hundred pretty, he's pretty much a hundred percent. Whereas Trey is a little bit less than hundred percent this time around. So that's one thing. Um, anyway, I say that to say, we're going to start with Trent Forrest. I love you, Trent Forrest. Glenn and I are probably more appreciative of what Trent brings to the table than most, but we're starting with him first. And it's actually kind of a tie. We'll do we'll do Wes Matthews in a second after this. But uh, fun fact, Trent and Wes played almost exactly the same amount of minutes this year. Trent played 414 minutes. Wes played 413 minutes. So they were almost exactly the same in what they did. Um, when I say the words Trent Forrest, I feel like, unfortunately for Trent, like a lot of the topic around him this year was, A, his – him becoming two-way ineligible for like two weeks. That was bizarre. That was a whole storyline. And at the end of the year, it was like, hey, why don't they cut Trent Forrest to sign Veet? I feel bad. We won't, we won't do that today. But um, what do you make of Trent Forrest's season? Because obviously the Hawks like him. Quinn likes him. They kept him around this whole time for a reason. What do you sort of make with him broadly and we'll kind of dig him from there? Yeah, he's he's one of those guys that, you know, on a good roster that's healthy, he's you're, he's depth, right? And it's, and it's mostly on, we all know, it's mostly on the defensive side of the ball where he's, you know, a, a a solid point of attack defender. He has some size. He knows how to use it. Um, he's impactful. You know, you know, generally good help defender, and all of that. But it's funny when you watch a season unfold. I know that when you and you watch the, the fan base kind of react. Once Trey got hurt, like it was like, oh man, like is Trent really what you need to kind of elevate up into a regular kind of rotation piece? And his offensive limitations really, you know, are, are limiting, you know, in, in that way. Now, how do you replace Trey Young? Like next to possible to do. Um, but I, I think had Kobe been healthy all year long and had more consistent time in the G League and maybe started playing a little bit earlier in the NBA season with, with the Hawks, maybe he would have been a little bit more ready. But, you know, Coach, I think when you think about on a roster spots 13, 14, 15, or you know, however you want to kind of think about where Trent falls, I think coaches largely just want someone who's responsible, professional, can do the basics, not going to go out there and just kind of, you know, just lose their lose their mind and, and and not be able to execute just the basics of what they're doing both ends of the court. And that's what Trent gives you, right? And any team is, I think, kind of lucky to have a guy like him towards the end of the bench, just like, oh, man, we have an injury at the guard position, or, or I just need, you know, break glass in case of emergency. Trent, I need you to go play defense on this person for two minutes, three <laughs> minutes, whatever it is. Someone's in foul trouble. Somebody gets hurt in the middle of the game or whatever. And he is the guy you can turn to and just 
have competent defensive play. And he, he's gotten a, offensively, he's gotten a little better attacking the middle of the floor, the floater, getting to the rim. He's gotten a little bit more physical uh, in that way, in, in my view. But he's that's still not something you're going to really kind of lean like a whole second unit offense on. That's still, to me, a tertiary kind of source of offense, almost irrespective of what you know, scoring situation and all those things. So just a, just a guy, a coach is not going to be nervous to throw on the floor and, and handle some defensive responsibility. Uh, and on the other end of the court, you got to have enough offensive juice on the other forward to kind of kind of cover up for his limitations there. Yeah, and I think you know just to kind of go down, I think it's a good a sort of good overview of what Trent is and what he isn't. I think number one, I always say this, but like the Hawks know what Trent is not. Like, there's nobody on the team that thinks that Trent is the guy that they want to run a lot. A lot. You can sort of learn a lot of guy, about about a guy by watching the way they they deploy him. They always wanted to have someone with him. Like Bogey a lot was with him on offense. They didn't want to just have it be the Trent show because that's not what Trent's skill set is. I, I know he's a point guard by trade, but in the NBA, offensively, he is, shall we say, below average offensively when you come when when you say well, talk about what he actually brings. Part of that's the shooting, part of that's just like you know, the whole package. But it is it is what it is. And I'll just give you I, I pulled a few numbers here. The offense did not do well when he was playing as the primary point guard. That's not a huge surprise. They were like eight points ish worse brought up possessions with him at point guard versus when he was not on the floor. That's not a surprise. The defense was better, which we'll come back to. Um, but they had about a 103 offensive rating at NBA NBA.com when he played this year. That is really rough. Like that's not a surprise necessarily, given what he can and can't do. And I'm glad you brought it up earlier. Like he was thrust into probably more minutes than you would have liked to play him. As a reminder, he was signed to a two-way contract in, in September. Like, I kind of thought he might come back. He was dangling out there all summer long. It was a small storyline. Again, he had the tie to Quinn from Utah when they brought him in. But, like, he wasn't even on the team until September. He was on a two-way all year. And he was on a, you know, not to do my whole bit about two-ways, but there's two kinds of two-ways. I always say this, but, like, there's there's the high floor plug-and-play two-way, which you kind of got into, like, the guy you trust. And then there's, like, kind of the developmental two-way. Trey Forrest is obviously the plug-and-play guy. In fact, I don't – I think I'm right about this. I don't think he went to College Park one time until he had to, until he was literally not eligible anymore. He was the very rare two-way that was just with the team all year long. And it's that's not what you normally see, but because of the injuries, Kobe being hurt as long as he was, him being the third point guard for a lot of the season and then was the number two point guard for a while, like he kind of had to be in a bigger role than they would have wanted him to be in, especially offensively, and that kind of – was borne out because I mean we can get into it if you want to that the, his individual offensive numbers are not exactly great and he's not a shooter and the weaknesses there are obvious. Yeah, not a shooter and probably an average ball handler, average passer, and yeah. and, and then you know so it's so on the ball not really enough off the ball not no spacing the gravity and, and those things. I mean he does like I don't know. Well, I think you and I would always call it kind of Dawn right kind of stuff. He'll go offensive, re- <laughs> offensive yeah. rebound. He'll you know he'll but use effort and just use what physical tools he has to try to contribute what ways he can. And sometimes that's helpful, and other times it's just not enough. You know, yeah. um, but there's no. I mean, he's the other thing is that he plays hard. He plays the right way. You know, like a, like he's always just taking a professional approach on both ends of the court. Um, but he's not the you know he's not the only guy in the league that can do. A couple of things, you know, you know, really solid, uh, really solid level, and some other things that you know, just just not enough there that you want to kind of deploy them as part of your 10, 11 man rotation all the time. Yeah, just because I have the numbers, like he shot twenty percent from three this year, and like I think he's probably a little better than that because that's really rough. But like he's not a shooter. Like it's uh, not even accuracy matters, of course, but it's also he doesn't get guarded and he doesn't take them. And the take them is almost half the battle. Like we could do examples of more prominent guys who've had this issue in the pack. Markel Foles is one right now is playing in the playoffs and he's just not getting guard. And that's the playoffs. At least it's more understandable in the playoffs. You're getting game plan for, but trust the kind of guy that even the regular season teams are like, no, we're not going to guard you. Like it's just not, and that's okay. And he does a good job. You mentioned his floater earlier. He didn't shoot it as well percentage wise, but that's a shot he's comfortable with. He knows how to operate as a non-shooter. He's used to that. He's never been a shooter. So it's like almost a little bit easier when you know what to do to create space and kind of take advantage of it, he's, he's a good cutter, all those things that you have to be. But in the end, if you can't shoot and you're not a dynamic on-ball player, which he's not, it is limiting. I do want to ask you quickly before we move on from him and kind of talk big, big picture, his defense. So, like, I have more than once this year 
said that I thought, I guess this is pre Kobe kind of making his appearance at the end of the year, but I thought Trent was pretty clearly their best on ball guard defender. Pretty low bar to clear, to be honest. For but sure. like that is, it, I said I said that knowing that like he's he's a pretty good he's a good defender. I think he's a good defender. Yeah. What he's not is a, like a total game changer. Like, and I, I, I hope I didn't paint that picture ever. It's not like he's not like prime Gary Payton the second, where he's like ruining your team. Like he's he's not Jalen Sucks. Like he right. he's a good defender. But like, does that sound right to you as someone you know you watch all this stuff? Like, what kind of level defender is he? Because I mean, better than what they had before uh, in front of him is not exactly the again not not a high bar to clear. Yeah, it is. It is funny how the optics of the roster shape the way you kind of look at a person. Yeah. And on this roster, you're like, well, he's the only guy who can like maybe handle a few minutes on this player or this player. Until, until Kobe, until Kobe broke out late, I swear it was like, man, can we? I'm thinking about like there were there were many nights where you and I talked online or offline. Like, do you just try Trent and like you just take the offense because it was so bad sometimes. I mean, even honestly, even in the playing game, I had a thought like, hey, do you just put Trent in there or or Kobe? Either one of them, just right. they, they 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 didn't they didn't trust those guys on offense yet, but it was like, man, this is so bad at the point of attack that you almost it's almost worth it. Yeah, I know it it, it is funny, um, but th- there were times when Bogey's playing a million minutes on the second night of a back to back, and and maybe the opponent is is such that you think like this is the game we could get away with playing Trent Forrest twenty minutes, you know, yep. or what have you, you know, and those things. And, th- and to me, those are the times where maybe they missed some opportunities to deploy him. Does it? How much does it change their record? Like probably not a ton, but I mean, may, maybe the you know the workload you know kind of management opportunity with some of the guys that were you know you know suboptimally playing a ton. Maybe he could, could kind of help there. But in terms of going back to your question, like how he, he's, I mean, he's saw a, a little at least solid defending on the ball. He knows how to use his size. I think a lot of something that's often uh, missed around nuance is he knows how to manage space. And that's a really important aspect of on-ball defense is managing that space. Uh, and so he's just very professional in that way. But he's not a stopper, right? Yeah. He, he's a guy who can generally, unless you're talking about the best, I don't know, 25 you know, players in the league offensively, keep the ball in front, route his the ball handler towards help, um, understand what the the guy he's guarding wants to get to and, and, and have some resistance uh, and deterrence to that. And so, th- and those are kind of the things that get you to what a B plus level kind of on ball defender, which is probably if you were using that kind of a grading system about, about what he is. Um, it just, it is it, one of those things like, you're not like, Oh, whew, Trent sand, we're good. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah. one of those, it's just one of those things that like, you're not, you can, if you throw Trent in and he's kind of being the primary guy defending at the point of attack, uh, coaching staff can kind of focus on okay, what's the next thing we need, right? And and he's just solid yeah. enough to kind of just cover that responsibility for for when he's on. So I, you know, I think a lot of teams are you know are have less than that at at, at that part of the roster. I uh, have young guys who are still learning how to defend, you know, whatever it might be. And so I think I think there were times where Quinn, you know, just felt like first of all, he's played for me before. He he knows what my expectations are. He knows what we're doing. Uh, and just that background alone probably has some value, and then just his kind of natural capabilities and professionalism are are just enough. But you, I mean, but he's not a guy you're going to build like into your rotation, you know, full time. Even as a defender, he's not that level of guy where his def- his defense doesn't get him paid for eight years. You know, even with offensive limitations, there are some guys that you know at guard or wing or whatever that are like so good defensively that even their offensive limitations, you know aren't able to kind of ever get them out of the rotation. He's not that level of guy. He's, he's kind of a, say we'll say a tear down from that. Today's show is brought to you by DoorDash. It's never too late to show your mom this love that you're looking for on this Mother's Day with DoorDash. Surprise mom with flowers, gadgets, self-care essentials, all in one place, delivered right to her door. Does your mom happen to have a sweet tooth? Or is, he, is she a tech enthusiast? Is she a beauty connoisseur? Is she happen to be outdoorsy? No matter what she happens to be into, make her smile with a fruit or flower bouquet, makeup, tech gear, workout wear, and much more. You can pair flowers with a gift card as well. You can celebrate any way she wants to. Or if you prefer something else, try a bookstore card or coffee gift shop. Uh, gift card as well. You can't go wrong with DoorDash. Get thoughtful gifts that you deserve with the convenience that you actually need. Choose same-day delivery or schedule a week ahead for when flowers and gifts should arrive at her door with the folks at DoorDash. Shop a savings that will actually make her proud. 
With a Dash Pass membership, you'll, you'll save with a zero dollar delivery fee and reduce service fees on eligible orders from Dash Pass merchants that meet the minimum total. Other fees, including service fees, apply. Get all your Mother's Day gifts all in one place and get 50% off your next order up to $50 when you spend $15 or more on the next flower, convenience, grocery, or retail order now with promo code Locked On MBA. That is Locked On MBA as the code. Order using DoorDash today. Terms apply. So quickly, a big picture on Trent. Uh, I know this is, and we're not going to really get it. Uh, there was all the talk about the end of the season and about how they handled the contract. And um, I will let everyone take their own opinion on what they, on what the, what happened there. Uh, but Trent is, and Trent is a free agent this summer. He is unrestricted. Uh, I've made the point several times, and it's not a negative about Trent, who we just talked about is, you know, a guy that you does not hurt your roster at the end of the bench, trustworthy, all those things. Uh, my point was at the time about the beat thing was basically. They can bring back Trent if they want to bring back Trent. Uh, I don't think he's going to have a, a ton of offers. It, it would shock me if Trent got more than the minimum anywhere. Um, it, maybe he will, and good for him. I'll be rooting for him. I'm a, I'm a fan of him personally, from what I understand. But um, you know, is he the kind of guy? By the way, he's not. He's, he's no longer two way eligible. So it's he's at the point of the league where you're not eligible to sign two ways anymore. It's minimum or nothing. I think for yeah. Trent. Yeah. Um, if I'm if I'm the Hawks, I'll just say this, and you can give your opinion. Uh, I wouldn't mind them signing Trent to a minimum this summer. I also think it would be fine if they didn't. I think he's right on the line of like the 15th man on a lot of rosters. Yeah. It won't surprise me if he's not in the league next year or if he's in the, if he's in the G League next year or going to Europe or whatever it's going to be. He's kind of right on that line, and it's kind of team-specific. You know, Quinn, again, Quinn likes him. Quinn's been pretty open about that. He has the tie to Utah. Um, he's, again, I don't want to overstate He's a very well-regarded off-court guy. But does any of that sound unreasonable? Like, I think that's just future-wise, we should at least mention, like, they can bring him back. I think they, if they offered him a deal, I think he'd probably sign it. I just, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's helpful. So so much of it is that we don't know what they're going to do at the guard position. Like, you know, I mean, and, ro and roster spot, all those things, all this stuff is on the back. Yeah, right. roster spots right. are at a premium. They have lots of guys coming back. All that's uh, definitely in the mix here. But just to back you, like, Every single one of these is going to be like at least all, all the guys who are free agents. It's like I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the roster. Yeah, I know it's like so you hear what everyone else is saying uh, according to the sources. Like oh they're going to trade trade. Like that's what sources from other or like whatever. <laughs> like that means nothing to me. He's literally nothing to me. But but I think everybody is like, do they think Trey and Dejounte can play together for like two or three? Like is that is that a thing they think they could make happen? It seems uh, like not a likely thing to me. Like if you're, you know, it seems like something yeah. they have to resolve one way or the other. Um, but that matters to me, like where Trent might kind of, kind of fit in. If you trade DeJounte and you are like, well, we're going to, you know, elevate Kobe's role next year. Um, you know, Co Kobe might struggle with some matchups. Like just one example, like in the Dallas, that, that last Dallas game, like he did pretty good on Kyrie, but once Kyrie got physical with him, Kobe really didn't know how to deal with that. Right. So, that, so you can Rookies. see some, right. Exa <laughs> exactly. So you yeah. can see some aspects where it's like, okay, we're going to elevate Kobe next year in a scenario where, to say, DeJounte is traded, right? Having Trent to be able to kind of throw on the court when Kobe's kind of not able to figure out and problem solve a certain matchup, that's a nice thing in that scenario. So it is there is some dependency on what they decide to do roster-wise, especially at the guard position. But I think there's, it, there's uh, many scenarios where it makes sense to have him as the guy that you can just kind of kind of go to if something's not going great for Kobe one night, you know, and I, and I think you and I both have very high expectations for Kobe. Yeah. But ideally he would have played a lot more this past year. Ideally he would have been more healthy this past year and maybe he got a little bit more experience. So even if next year is like the first two months of the season where Kobe is still getting reps, still getting used to the physical play, still getting used to all the aspects of kind of being in the rotation, Trent's a guy that you can kind of turn to and a critical part of the game that, you know, even if it's just a critical possession late, you know, the team's down one, 10 seconds left, whatever it is, right? There's a lot of different kind of situational um, kind of uh, instances where he's a guy that you just, just, just nice to have. Uh, but a lot of that does come down to how they shape their guard position on the roster next year. Yeah, it will definitely come up again. I'm very confident in one of these player reviews or more than one, but I would agree with the general point. Like if, if they trade Trey or DeJounte, whatever that'll be talked about later um, and elevate Kobe there. There is going to be somebody on the team somewhere that's in the Trent role from this year, whether it's yeah. Trent or not, like they're going to need whether, whether, whether it's one of their two way guys, whether it's their 15th roster spot guy, there's always a need for a third, fourth point guard type on your team. Uh, and the Hawks have a pretty weird setup right now with Trey and DeJounte and that you're normally you're starting two guards, not your backup point guard. 
that's not everybody's set up. In fact, that's most teams, not their setup, but essentially every game this year where Trey and DeJounte were both available, they did the stagger and, and DeJounte was a back point guard every single time they were available together. Yeah. Um, if that changes in the future and Kobe gets that role, they still want to have a third guy and whether it's Trent or not is we will see on that. I just think that he'll be on the mar He'll be on the margin somewhere. Um, I, I would understand it both ways. And that's not a negative. Again, I think just skill wise and culture wise, you and I are predisposed to kind of appreciating Trent more than most would be. Yeah. And like next year, is that Trent or is it like a Chris Dunn type or, you know, they're, they're or, like, or, a, oh, or a rookie or, you know, right. anybody on a minimum con. We, we just don't know. It's exactly, uh, but we'll see about Trent. All right. Let's pivot to the other uh, guy on this uh, free agent range. It's unrestricted. Uh, probably even less to say, honestly, about this guy. Um, not for any reason other than just the fact that he's uh, an elder statesman. He's my age, which is always fun. Wes Matthews. So I said it before on, on Trent's side, he played essentially the same amount of minutes as Trent. And honestly, Glenn, I'll say this. I think Wes played about as much as I thought he was going to play coming into the year. Does that make, is that, does that sound right? Or am, or am I wrong? It was I, like, it depends. So, so there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. Well, I know. That's what it was. I think, Quinn, I think, I think Quinn would have liked to have played him more. I agree. I, I think the first, I don't know, six to eight weeks of the season, he was not healthy at all. Well, and, and at the end, he was also, his hamstring was, I don't, I'd love to know actually from him in a candid setting how his hamstring has been because he had the, that was why he was out early in the year. And at the end of the year, he kept sitting like two out of every three games and it was always hamstring. And I, I don't know if he was actually hurt. It's one of those things where it's like they weren't trying at the end of the year, last three, four games. He was out for hamstring. Was he hurt? Could he have played? I don't know. But yeah, it's it's nuanced. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, at, at the end, you would think, okay, I, I, would, I think he's actually hurt because no Bay, no Jalen at times, yeah. you know, and it's like, you know, they needed him. And, and <laughs> I mean, they looked like they were still trying to win games. Like, you know, at, at one point in time, they're being the, in the 10 spot was, you know, fade a complete. It seemed like, and then maybe they, you know, just yeah, the last, the last, easy at that point. the last three games, they didn't really try that hard, even though they were trying yeah. to get guys. And by the way, I asked the question on purpose because it is so nuanced. And like, if you told me that Bay was going to be out for the season and Jalen wouldn't play and, and would be out for a while and Mo Gay would play essentially none, I would have told you West play, would play more, but coming into the year, if you just assume this is the roster. Yeah. I think, Quinn might have been tempted to play Wes more. And I, I know we talked about that on either online or offline, probably both before the season. It was like, hey, Quinn's going to be probably maybe overplay Wes Matthews because he's that kind of yeah. goat. He's that safety blanket guy. But also, he, at this point in his career, and we'll talk about that now, I guess, like how he's actually played, he's he's an end of bench guy. Like he's not the guy he used to be even two years ago. He's he's fallen off a step. He's 37, maybe 38. Like it's it's understandable. And when he played, he wasn't like unplayable. But also, he didn't necessarily like the world on fire. It was like kind of, he and Trent kind of have overlap in some respects. They're different players, but it was like, hey, he'll execute for you on defense. On offense, he doesn't give you really anything other than shooting. That's kind of it. I don't know. I I, I really like West. By the way, he was he's awesome. With the, he's awesome with the media. He was really good at, at exit interviews. Like he's just a vet. He's just like a vet yeah. in capital letters. Yeah. But uh, what do you make of him? Like in his on court impact? Because I want to. I'll circle back to the off court uh, later on. But we're on court this year. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there there were times like the last you know regular season Boston game, like he closed on Mason Tatum. Like there there aren't many guy veterans you're gonna have on your roster where coaches turn to that all out of nowhere. So you're actually closing the game on this guy, and Tatum's obviously a you know great player. Um, and the other situations where you know the final possession, final defensive possession, in a one possession game, he's out there you know, with an important role there. And again, it comes back to his professionalism experience. He's just all the experience in the world knows what he's doing. I, I think the other aspect that sometimes is missed is offensively. He makes shots, you know, for a guy, you know, at, at, at where he is kind of in the rotation, kind of one foot in the rotation, like, you know, off the seat all the season long is that he's, I mean, even when he's not making them, he takes them like he, you know, and that's what coaches really care about. Take the yep. shot when you're open. You right. Shoot. And then if there's a closeout defender, he doesn't have the most juice to like like blow by him, but he's trying to get to the paint and kick out, right? He know so you can see he knows what Quinn wants. He's trying to execute that that thing, even if it's not so great. Now, what's interesting is that I said like through December and January that the Hawks needed to have Bay attack the paint because basically when like especially when Jalen was out, they didn't have anyone that could that could do that. And you know, Bay and, and Bay took that on and drove. 
but so when it was West plus say Bogey, and but and Bogey's is kind of crafty when he can tack the paint <laughs> from the middle, right? You know, and he's got a pretty good floater, a little step back, you know, he kind of gets to his stuff. But basically, if he's out there with other guys who really can't attack the paint, that's where his offensive kind of limitation becomes, you know, fit related in terms of who else he's on the court with. Right, you know, there are times when he's on with. I, mean, I have no idea how many minutes he played, say, with with um, Trent. But we're like, at least Trent's like, if, hey, if 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 you know, Wes is spacing the floor, at least I can tack and, and know I can kind of kick out to a shooter. So his willingness to take shots, just he, he, even offensively, even though he's not, you know, you know, full of this athleticism and playmaking or anything like that at this point, he kind of does the job you want of someone who's playing off the ball, just catch, take the shot that's there. Uh, if you get a closeout, just get past them and try to get to the paint touch and kick it out or whatever it might be. And and so, again, just reliable, right? Covering the basics, the fundamentals, the basic principles, and knowing all the stuff that's kind of needed and doing what he can with the ability he has at this point in his career and, and just being a guy – a coach trusts, you know, and and I think I think that's kind of where his value sits is in, in being uh, trustworthy from a coaching perspective. All right, that is all for part one with myself and Glenn Willis. We do have part two available for you right now. So go ahead and find that podcast in your podcast player of choosing. It should be available for you immediately. So click on over to that for the rest of the conversation. Please subscribe to the podcast. Please leave five-star ratings and reviews. Follow the show on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. Follow me there as well at BT Roll. And also follow my written work on the Hawks and Braves, etc. at patreon.com slash BT Roland. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we'll see you all with part two right now.